call this regular meeting of the Ketchikan City Council to order. Please call the roll. Coos? Here. Flora? Here. Zingy? Here. Piper? Here. Gage? Here. Ison? Here. Sieberton? Here. Now, uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. That uh, brings us down to our first um, business. It's a public hearing on liquor license protest beverage dispensary license 4799 Creek Street Cabaret. Is there anybody here to speak to that tonight? Come on down. Hi. Welcome. Um, I think I know about all of you. <laughs> um, uh, the, the issue is the taxes. Uh, taxes on the property uh, charge delinquent. I can pay them off tomorrow. Um, and then there, there were taxes on it, business property. You know, I wasn't even aware of those. I, I just opened up your certified letter prior to coming down here. Um, so I, uh, uh, I, I would like to look at those, but I can pay them certainly before the end of the month. Yeah, but I, I'd have to see what they are. But, but the, uh, the taxes on the building, I can pay tomorrow. Anybody have any questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right, we'll close that public hearing, and we will open a public hearing on Resolution 182696, amending the 2018 General Government Operating <coughs> Capital Budget by modifying appropriations for the Community Grant Program to include funds from the Marijuana Sales Tax Fund for Homeless Population Programs, providing for an appropriation for Small Business Development Centers. Is there anybody here to speak to that tonight? See, and then we'll close that meeting. That brings us down to communications. The first thing in the communications, we have a proclamation on Alcohol Awareness Month, uh, whereas excessive drinking is responsible for more than 4,300 deaths among underage youth each year, and whereas alcohol is the most commonly used addictive substance in the United States, whereas more than 1.6 million young people re report driving under the influence of alcohol in the past year, uh, whereas young people who begin drinking before age 15 are four times more likely to develop alcohol dependence than those who begin drinking at 21, where <coughs> drinking by persons under the age of 21 is linked to 189,000 emergency room visits, whereas the typical American will see 100,000 beer commercials before he or she turns 18, whereas kids who drink are more likely to be victim of violent crime, to be involved in alcohol-related traffic crashes, and have serious school-related problems, whereas a supportive family environment is associated with lowered rates of alcohol use for adolescents, whereas kids who have conversations with their parents and learn a lot about the dangers alcohol and drugs use use are more are 50 percent less likely to use alcohol and drugs than those who do, don't have such conversations now therefore be it resolved i the williams third mayor of the city of ketchikan last to do hereby proclaim april 2018 as alcohol awareness month and call upon all citizens parents governmental agencies public and private institutions businesses hospitals schools and colleges to support the effort that will provide early education about alcoholism and addiction and increased support for individuals and families coping with alcoholism. Through these efforts together, we can provide help, hope, and healing for those in our community who are facing challenges with alcohol use and abuse. Is there anybody here to accept the proclamation? Thank you so much for taking your time to talk about this issue here in Ketchikan. My name is Reed Harding. I live in 121 Nadu, and this is my daughter here with me, and she's a, a K High student. Um, I want to read this little short letter to you that I wrote. Um, all of April is Alcohol Awareness Month, which is sponsored by the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Use. We'll call them NCAD because that's handy. And the Substance Abuse Task Force of Ketchikan. I don't have a clever acronym for them. Um, this year's theme is about changing our attitude that drinking is a rite of passage. And I think that's an attitude that's been going on here in Ketchikan for a really long time. Um, this theme speaks to the need to provide educa education to the youth about the dangers of underage drinking and drug use. According to our Youth Risk Behavioral Survey they do every two years here in Ketchikan, 2017, one in ten youth report binge drinking in a month. Almost one in four youth report having alcoholic drink in the last 30 days. So we have a lot of youth that are drinking. I think nationwide, for every 10 drinks sold, at least one drink is gonna to go to a minor. 
Um, NCAD offers the following sobering facts. Alcohol and drugs are leading cause of crime among youth. Alcohol and drugs are leading factors in teenage suicide. And more than 23 million people over the age of 12 are addicted to alcohol and other drugs. Um, I've been talking to a lot of people here in Ketchikan and youth drink for many reasons. Um, some drink to check out from family problems or issues with school. Some drink because of loneliness, low self-esteem, depression, anxiety. Uh, they may fit, fit in, they may drink to fit in or deal with social pressure, but whatever the reason they're drinking, it's clear that alcohol is not going to solve their problem. As our youth grow up, they're exposed more frequently to drugs and alcohol. Parents are faced with difficult challenges and can sometimes find themselves forgiving underage drinking as a rite of passage. They may just sit back hoping their kids will figure it out on their own, or they can take an active role, learn about alcohol and drugs again for themselves, and talk to their kids about it. It's important to take advantage of those teachable moments when parents, where parents and other concerned adults, what I also think is important to point out, um, not everybody here in Ketchik can has a strong family, and so we do rely on other people, other adults to look out for our youth, and I think that's, that's a really important thing to say, and that was brought up to me today. The big talk is, is not as important as many smaller talks. Um, when issues come up at TV, uh, well, issues come up on the TV or at school or with their friends. NCAD offers a few guidelines that can help parents talk about drug and alcohol abuse. The first is to listen before you talk. You know that they're important if you listen first. The next is to ask open-ended questions. Be truthful and share about your own personal experiences and try to remain positive as the idea is to build a bridge, not a wall. If there's an opportunity to get involved with youth, do it. Once again, it's not about an amazing day or a single event when trying to connect with youth. It's about many smaller moments, prioritizing quantity of time over quality. Going out to eat together can be a special event, but sitting down and eating together as a family will build stronger connections in the long run. Parents can help change the attitudes their kids have by making it clear that drinking is not a rite of passage. It does not have to be part of growing up and is not needed to be cool or to fit in. Youth can learn that alcohol is not necessary for a good time. Um, I think everybody here has stories about drinking in their youth. Um, if you're from Ketchikan, it seems like it's a, a very common thing. But I think it's also important to hear from our youth. So. Um, I have a friend who's only about 14 years old, and he drinks every single day. And uh, he'll call me sometimes in the middle of the night, and it's obvious he's drunk, and he'll just say he's depressed and cry into the phone. It just makes me sad. That's all. I appreciate your guys' time, and thank you so much for making this proclamation. I think it's really important that we recognize that, and as parents and grandparents, and just concerned members of the community. When we see youth that are drinking, that we say, it's not okay. Thank you very much. Yes. All right, um, I have no one else signed up to speak. Is there somebody here who'd like to address the council tonight that did not sign up? Seeing that, we'll move on. That brings us down to consent agenda. I have a couple ideas to throw at you. Under 7A, I was thinking of Six, the pavement overlay seven and eight, the first reading of those ordinances of what the work we did last time on the community agencies, was switching the funds, and then the cemetery budget transfer number 10. So six, seven, eight, and 10 on the new business. And then under KPU, I have two and three. Change order, change order on the raw water and uh, telephone line truck. If we have no problems, we'll add those to the consent agenda. And I'll ask for a motion. Your Honor, I move the consent. Second. Moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, can you read the items? <laughs> Approval of minutes, regular city council meeting of April 5th, 2018, exempting the procurement of annual dispatch center hardware and software maintenance services from competitive bidding rent quotation requirements of the Ketchikan Municipal Code with Procom Pro Alaska, LLC, exempting the procurement of annual video streaming and agenda management software maintenance services from competitive bidding and rent quotation requirements of the Ketchikan Municipal Code. That's with Granicus. 
Change order number one final to contract number 1722, solid waste equipment building foundation and slab, quality concrete and landscape, LLC. Exempting the procurement of annual co-location services for the telecommunications division from the competitive bidding written quotation requirements of the Ketchikan Municipal Code, and that's with greenhouse data. A budget transfer for the award of contract number 1807, the 2018 pavement overlays and surface repairs with CECON. Ordinance number 18, 1876, adding a new subsection E to Ketchikan Municipal Code 3.04.130, entitled Use of Proceeds of Sales Tax, concerning the use of the marijuana sales tax in first reading. Resolution number 18-2696, amending the 2018 general government and KPU operating and capital budgets by modifying appropriations for the community grant program to include funding from the marijuana sales tax fund for homeless population programs and providing for an appropriation for the Small Business Development Center. A budget transfer for the cemetery management system. Change order number one final to contract number 1634, the raw water main replacement with BAM LLC. And finally, the award of contract number 1813, the telephone line truck with RWC International. All right, thank you. Does anybody have any questions on anything? Call the roll. Yes. Yes. Flora? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Kiefer? Yes. Gage? Yes. Isom? Yes. Yes, <coughs> that passes seven to nothing. Brings us down to unfinished business. General Government six A one liquor license renewal protest beverage dispensary Creek Street Cabaret. Um, I believe we did alternative. Did we do alternative motion number two? I think as long as it's paid or yes. Okay. And it has not been. And he said, uh, Mr. Ritchie came tonight saying he'd have it all paid by the end of the month. Um, what would the council like to do? First of all, Your Honor, um, Katie, is there a timeline on when we we're supposed to send this protest? Yes. Um, we have 60 days, and I need to send the letter tomorrow to the to, 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 to make it Tomorrow's work. the 60 days? Uh, I can't remember if it's the 23rd or 24th, but council, act, council has no opportunity to take action after tonight. They say he was going to pay it tomorrow. He, he, he was planning to pay the property tax that he had to do something with the personal I, property tax, right? Yeah, I don't know that he realized it was both business and personal. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked with him quite a bit about it, but we're trying to communicate. Okay. So tonight, if the council is going to protest tonight, it's the only night. If he pays everything tomorrow, I can wait till the end of the day to send, I email the letter. I can wait to send it well, if, if we protest it and he gets it done, can we withdraw it or back yes. off? Yes, yes, we can. We can withdraw it at any time before the AMCO board meets. Do we know they scheduled to meet? Hmm? Do we know when they scheduled to meet? No, I don't know. So you need a motion? Um, one we or two? do need a motion. It would be number or two. 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 Yes. Your Honor. Go ahead, Bob. I'm new to that. Pursuant to KMC. 5.20.050A13 and B, the City Council protests the renewal of the beverage dispensary license number 4799 issued to Creek Street Cabaret on the basis set forth in the proposed protest attached to the City Clerk's Memorandum of April 11, 2018, and to notify the Alcohol and Marijuana Control Board of such protests. Second. Second. Moved and second. And I think that if we just make sure that they understand that if they can take care of all this in a timely manner, we can withdraw the protest. Yes, and I will communicate that to Mr. Ritchie. Any other questions? Call the roll. Flora? Yes. Coos? Yes. Sieverton? Yes. Ison? Yes. Gage? No. Kiefer? No. And Z? No. Okay, that passes four to three. That takes us down to new business, general government 2018-2022, Ketchikan Public Library Strategic Plan Update. Come on down, we've been waiting for you. Good evening, everyone. Um, good evening, Mayor Williams and council members. Uh, I'm Pat Tully, I'm the director of the Ketchikan Public Library, and I'm here to report on the implementation of our strategic plan during the first quarter of 2018. Uh, so the full report is in your packet, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail. Um, I'll just mention a few things that we've done. So 
the first goal of the plan is that Ketchikan Public Library is a welcoming, beautiful, and inviting space. This goal speaks to the library as a place. So here are a few of our activities toward that goal. The Children's Community Garden Programs began in early in March. One program involves starting plants which are now under grow lamps in the Children's Library. They'll be transplanted into the garden during a program next month. And as you might have seen on Facebook, if you're on Facebook, um, this week we received a box of live worms uh, which are going to figure prominently um, on our next um, uh, program uh, on the garden um, this Saturday. Do you need any slugs? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not looking for slugs at this time. <laughs> Those are local worms, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we want to get a foul of DEC here by bringing in some furry worms. I will bring that to the garden's coordinator. Yeah, make sure they speak it now. <laughs> And another thing we've done is that the Friends of the Library have provided $500 to purchase three weeping cedar trees that are going to be planted near the library's flagpole in late May. So the second goal, uh, the second goal um, of the plan is that the library serves the Ketchikan community. And this goal concerns the library's role in providing access to informational, cultural, and recreational materials of all kinds through our collections, our programs, and our services. So here are a few things that we've done um, this past quarter. The library's Wi-Fi access codes, um, which we give to patrons so that they can link their phone or tablet to the internet, are now good for one entire day instead of one hour. And that has been a very popular change. Also, the library has applied for and received a $1,500 grant from the State Library to replace three public laptops that are no longer working. So the third goal in the plan is that the library engages with the community. This goal concerns the library's partnering with other local organizations, our public outreach, and marketing library services and programs. Here are some of our activities this quarter. The library is partnering with other Alaska public libraries and the Alaska Small Business Development Centers to apply for a state grant to improve services to local entrepreneurs and businesses. Also, the Children's Library is experimenting with a design program called Canva to improve the quality and reach of our flyers and posters. And then we're also um, uh, considering advertising multiple programs on one flyer instead of having a separate flyer for each program. And finally, the library is a growing, vibrant organization. This fourth and final goal concerns the people and the internal processes of the library and making them as effective as, and efficient as possible. So here are a few of our activities this past quarter. We reorganized staff air, work areas and storage spaces with seasonal displays and supplies moved into storage to increase the efficiencies of the active um, work areas. And in February, Children's Library Assistant Rebecca Jackson, um, who is one of the um, principal um, organizers for the Children's Community Garden, attended the Southeast Alaska Gardening Conference in Haines. So in addition to the full report that's in your packet, we've also linked that report onto our library website in the About Us section. So many of these things we would have done even without a strategic plan. What the plan provides for us in the library is a context for thinking about what we do and how we can improve. What the strategic plan provides for you and for the community is a document with which to hold the library accountable for accomplishing the goals that we set forth in the plan. So thank you all very much for your attention and for your support for the library and the work we do with the people of Ketchikan. So any questions? Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, that brings us down to new business 782, the contract 1719 update. Uplines planning to support expanded marine facilities and large cruise ship vessels, Moffat and Nichols. You bet, get started. So.
I like the color of water in the beaches. That's, that, that, that's, that, that's up ones, down ones, all around the town. Right? Speaks for itself, right? It does. Was that settlers' yeah. new reconfiguration? Yes. <laughs> yes. That's what, what the city floats look like. We're done. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's worms also in that picture as well. You have to look at it. <laughs> So good evening. My name is Scott Lagur. I'm with the firm of Moffat and Nicola. I'm a waterfront planner. Of course, uh, I've spoken to this group before. It's a pleasure, of course, to, to be back uh, with you and presenting the final draft associated with our work on the upland planning and support areas um, that are uh, planned and designed to uh, provide uh, a more welcoming and uh, exciting experience for guests as well as to uh, to be able to accommodate larger numbers of guests and vehicles associated with any improvements that are made to the berths uh, with the larger ships. Uh, I uh, will be brief in some of these slides, which you've already seen before, and I know that hopefully in your package you were all able to uh, review aspects of the draft that we submitted and certainly will answer any questions that you have this evening. But as you're aware that the, the intent of the plan was to really look and assess and formulate a strategy on the uplands for berths one, two, three, and for four uh, as to how we can support greater numbers of passengers uh, associated with larger ships that could be calling uh, at each one of those locations. Uh, and to make sure that we're delivering a quality guest experience as you move forward with those and safe. Uh, and to make sure that we're creating spaces that are integral uh, and uh, work in harmony with many of the existing retailers uh, and other activities that you have along the waterfront. And certainly this is all about growing both the economic and social benefit that um, the cruise passengers and the presence of these lines make uh, to this community, as well as the other spillover effects associated with this type of commerce. The timeline for the project is one that started back in May. Um, the numbers indicate key areas where we had uh, public work sessions. And in fact, there were a total of three public work sessions going all the way back to September of last year. Our second one was in November. And our third was just uh, a few months ago at the end of January. And here we are at the end of the process uh, presenting the final um, draft uh, components of the plan. Uh, we are also working uh, with our team and Sean McFarlane uh, and his design team in the Anchorage office to make sure that many of the improvements are being integrated in the design process for births one and two. And I know that's information that has been provided to you as part of a, a separate presentation recently. And as I mentioned, uh, in terms of the public outreach, this has really been a hallmark of all the planning work on the waterfront uh, and making sure that we're in constant consultation with the um, your residents, with the users on the waterfront and other stakeholders, uh, and to make sure that we're, we're starting from a point of common information and walking through and working through a series, an iterative series of concepts and ideas to get to a, a final and end result. Uh, I believe through the course of all of the public meetings, we had uh, at least 120 members of the public show up uh, in total to all three meetings. Uh, the work really started, uh, it was really sort of working two aspects of the problem. Number one, from a quantitative standpoint, and then from a qualitative standpoint, what we feel, what we think will create better experiences, better spaces on the waterfront, and how we can accommodate larger numbers of guests. From a quantitative standpoint, and as you recall from my last presentation, we spent a lot of time not just doing uh, observations of what's going on on the waterfront and talking to stakeholders, but um, recording and modeling the movement of both passengers and vehicles. And much of the vehicle traffic was also numbers that are part of DOT, Alaska <laughs> DOT's um, traffic counts and studies that have been done for Water Street, Front Street, and others. And building a model that looks at over time as births one, two, and possibly three and four are improved, that during the AM peak, during that window of when that first ship arrives, whether it's at 6.30 or 7 o'clock, to uh, the last ship, 8.30, 9.00, 9.30, we could potentially have an increase in foot track of traffic of between 3,500 and 4,000 uh, 3, guests on the street. 
effectively an, an additional cruise ship. Where are they going? Where are they routing? Uh, what are the splits? You sort of very much like traffic. You know, are they going uh, you know left or right, up the street, onto buses, and really modeling that through to understand the behavior and come up with not just sort of a model that we can look at in terms of guests, but really identify where in the future the congestion points could be. Uh, and this graphic shows you, you know, both today the existing birth one, you can see that in the red red is generally bad, that we would have increased congestion in certain areas. Uh, so using these models to really quantify uh, in a reliable way where there'd be increased congestion and making sure that we're making improvements to at least hold steady, if not improve the condition uh, where congestion is anticipated to occur with um, larger vessels and more passengers and more uh, ground transportation activities on the street. So that was a quantitative side. We took that data and then from our qualitative analysis and from a design standpoint and again working in harmony uh, uh, with uh, the operators and the community to really come up with a sequence of improvements at each of the four birth locations. Uh, shown here is a zoomed out view of those improvements uh, at birth one and let me grab my laser pointer here. This location as we discussed last time. Uh, here, shown in the green on this and all subsequent drawings are the proposed improvements at berths one and two. So moving the vessels outward onto the floating, new floating dock positions with connecting um, bridges to the floating docks, picking up those guests, having them move to a common arrival experience, much like you already have at birth two, in this case, creating a, a landing zone uh, with a wood treatment uh, and organized buildings and other sort of arrival experiences. Uh, also being able to have independent tour operators and then bringing guests either to ground transportation facilities or into the town. And here's just a close up view of what that could look like. Again, just looking at in a 2D plan form, and, and this is, remember, at a master planning level, um, there certainly will be subsequent design uh, on all of these locations uh, if approved and, uh, and determined that these improvements would move forward uh, for the city. But as you can see here in plan, just creating a consistent arrival sequence, much like you already have at birth two, of using a lot of the textured wood, uh, buildings, benches, uh, a common building that would allow for independent uh, sales to occur in one location in a building that's consistent with the fabric that you already have at many of the other birth locations, as well as a small storage area, uh, so that you, you also have a very clean and uniform arrival experience and still maintaining more than 16 feet of unencumbered space into the downtown. Uh, having now, by pushing the vessels offshore, you're not uh, cluttering the waterfront with a lot of gangway and other systems. All of that occurs uh, on the floating pontoon, so you actually create more area for uh, allowing for greater numbers of ground transportation and buses and the other types of marshalling activities that you need to accommodate these larger ships. And for Earth One and all other berths, and this is contained in the report, the the, the iconographic sort of things that are shown in the plan view, a circle, a square, are really representative, of course, of bollards, uh, art installations, uh, open bench seating, railing features, lighting features, and of course, building features. And all of these would uh, are, are placed on the plan, but certainly subject to additional design review uh, and consideration uh, as and if this project in each location moves forward. We certainly felt, and uh, we, uh, including the voice of the community, I think one of the things that was imparted to us was that uh, uh, there's great opportunity at each location for public art, uh, wayfinding, and things that really allow for the arrival experience of Catch Can to be celebrated. Uh, and uh, so the idea of creating, whether it's consistent uh, iconographic types of art installations and vertical installations that even serve as wayfinding and monumentation was something that the community, I think uh, many of those who participate in the work sessions, was very supportive of, as well as a, an improved signage and wayfinding system that not just uh, extends on these arrival locations, but extends back into the city as well, in the city streets. 
I apologize, a little hard to read, but we did on each one of these, uh, uh, each one of the options that's shown uh, a workup of potential uh, probable costs for birth one, what is shown in the plan. The range that we're showing here is anywhere between $526,000 to $800,000 of improvement based on the things that we're showing, the bollards, the small buildings, the wood surfacing, uh, and other treatments that are in that location. Birth two, fairly straightforward in this location, uh, really trying to focus on, again, maximizing and organizing the ground transportation system, especially as the birth is now, per, the actual birthing is pushed offshore on the floating pontoon. We have two different arrival experiences. And in fact, as you recall last time, uh, we had a, an extended ramp that was coming out into this zone with the ongoing design, the, the sort of uh, connection points have shifted a little bit. So we've actually shifted the extension of the wood walkway ramp a little further south and reduced what we had up in the northern side. But effectively, from what, you, what we showed you last time, the majority of the option remains the same. Uh, having our connection, our walkway to the existing um, rain gauge and sculpture area and the visitor information center and the independent shore uh, providers that are there uh, continuing to, to have the existing uh, two food and beverage outlets and picnic tables and that extending a ramp uh, wood connection to the current ramp uh, or sorry, excuse me to the plan ramp that would be in that location moving forward total cost for the improvements that we're showing here, again, are very similar to the previous one. Uh, the range is between $530,000 to uh, $800,000 of improvement for birth two. Birth three always was the more challenging one and certainly the more controversial one in terms of the amount of time that we've spent uh, both in discussions with this group uh, and with the public. Uh, namely because we have a lot of different activities coming into a very small space, those associated with the existing birth three, with tender operations and the waterfront promenade and individuals uh, coming down past Sockeye Sam, sort of all into this common collection point. Uh, and really, as we've talked, the primary place that we can start to uh, relieve a bit of this anticipated future congestion uh, is uh, through modification of the Tongass parking lot. Currently, we have 99 parking spaces in that on that lot. Uh, the spaces are dimensioned about 8 by 16, which is very small. Uh, what we're recommending overall as part of the improvement, and let me just jump ahead to this slide, it'll be a bit clearer, is to modify the parking lot, bringing it down to 78 spaces, but increasing the stall size to 9 by 18, which is a uh, much more uh, and larger standard, so that we believe that will give higher utility to all the parking spaces as to just potentially some of the parking spaces when you have large vehicles that are parking sometimes, it prevents you from using effectively all the parking spaces that are there. So what we're showing here is 78 parking spaces in that location, pushing, sort of demoing the existing sidewalk and pushing it inward so that we can get a nice pedestrian walking area past the Tongass building uh, and uh, allow for two lanes of bus parking, loading and offloading in that location. Uh, introducing another wood arrival experience surrounded by bollards uh, and creating a much more direct and smooth pedestrian connection from this arrival experience to either the bus loading zone and moving southward or Cross, crossing the street and up around Eagle Park and into the downtown area. Total cost for the improvements that are shown here range between 875,000 and 1.33 million in terms of total improvements. And as you'll see, but just to, while we're on the slide, I think critical in this coming season is to really work through 
uh, making sure that we understand the current parking lot and how it's utilized. It's very utilized, but in terms of, you know, are there a few vacant spaces during season, during the, the peak operation times? Can we uh, count and find other spaces in the area that we can utilize or have some behavioral changes from employees that are parking in the slot to free it up for guests? And certainly to make sure that the current LID that's in place to understand the um, the ramifications of any changes to parking into that so that we're not creating any kind of a, of a negative outcome uh, to the retailers and those who were participants of that existing LID. And then finally at birth four, uh, we made a series of recommendations as to how uh, an arrival experience could be improved in this area as well. Uh, predominantly creating an arrival area and also a visitor information uh, building and uh, moving the restrooms over into a common building, pushing the independent uh, shore providers into this sort of central plaza and even creating the opportunity for one or, or, or maybe multiple food and beverage providers to be present with some outdoor dining and seating, much like you have at birth two, uh, encouraging the paving of the balance of the lot and allowing independent and smaller vehicles to be marshaled and parked uh, in this location and freeing up to the greatest amount possible uh, the current location next to the berth for a uh, bus parking. And I believe we have uh, about 20 buses depicted, maybe it's 21 depicted uh, here in this image. Oops. Uh, over the long term, the potential could be the encouraged redevelopment uh, of portions of these parcels. And I'll back up a slide just to show you what that could look like. This is just a, a potential uh, very long uh, opportunity, and that would just be working with surrounding property owners to see if there is a future way to ultimately anchor this zone in a, in a different way and create um, uh, new amenities, new attractions that could could be located in this look into this uh, into the site a sequence of sites. Uh, the total cost for what we're showing here in the plan range from one point seven. Uh, million dollars to about two point zero million dollars in terms of improvements, and that includes, of course, a larger building and uh, and uh, the wood platform. So there's some and all the asphalt. There's some some extensive uh, improvements that are recommended as part of that. In totality, in terms of bursts one through three, the total improvements that we're showing in the plan uh, range between one point nine million and two point nine eight million in land side upland improvements at bursts one, two, and three. Um, in just terms of, of general percentages, uh, this represents an additional five to maybe seven percent of the total costs that are being envisioned for bursts one and two improvements. So, on a percentage basis, we believe it's a you know it's uh, I don't want to say it's minimal, but it, they're small in terms of the overall totality of the potential investment in dollars that would be pledged to improvements on the waterfront. But clearly, these are the zones that the, the guests are going are going to experience uh, both in terms of the guest reviews that are made uh, and just sort of the daily life also of the people that are there uh, and the retailers are there. And so we do believe that these will be very important improvements that are made hand-in-hand uh, -hand with the in-water improvements that you may contemplate and advance moving forward. Uh, next steps and the recommended next steps in our plan, of course, uh, we would recommend that you advance um, uh, further stages of design, especially at, at Burst 1 and 2, uh, in concert with the uh, design work that's ongoing uh, for the in-water improvements. Uh, as I mentioned, when we were on birth three, we believe there's a series of, of analysis and follow-on work uh, to really make sure that we're making good decisions by any modification to the existing parking lot and the 99 spaces that are there. And we've outlined a series of steps that really should be taken prior to uh, any modification. And we really then, by the end of the season, being able to go back and revisit uh, the proposed birth three uh, improvements and any modifications to the existing parking lot. Other improvements, of course, is working with the birth four owners to implement implement some or all of the recommendations uh, uh, associated with this plan uh, to continue uh, the work that this group, uh, the council is making uh, and the community is making to finalize the waterfront promenade as it moves uh, past the uh, uh, the, um, the lumberjack show and other amenities all the way over to Creek Street. 
Uh, we heard loud and clear from many of the residents who were participating in our public meetings that they would love to see continued look at how the implications of increased uh, both traffic and guest traffic and vehicular traffic, how that impacts the, the broader street network and the overall guest experience within the, the city overall. Uh, and to make recommendations uh, as part of follow-on work to really see how broader improvements destination-wide can be made uh, to the city, and even, the city and even extending out into the borough. And consistently we're hearing uh, signage and wayfinding being probably one of the most important um, aspects of that. And we've made uh, a lot of detailed observations and thoughts as part of our recommendations in the plan moving forward. Um, continued experimentation of new ways to marshal traffic and guest, guest flows. Uh, I think Steve and his team have done a great job um, even now getting ready for the coming season to start to study through the placement of barriers and the independence to really start to even now in this season without spending any dollars um, seeing um, how behavior changes and where people dwell and move uh, giving, uh, giving the placement of the uh, um, the bollards and the placement of the barriers and some of the structures that, that have already been arranged now at burst one, two, and three. And I think that uh, through photography and just counts and observation, there'll be a lot to learn in this season that could go into follow-on design process. Uh, and then to further assess, assess the potential benefit associated with any kind of redevelopment associated with uh, parcels adjacent to birth four moving forward. Um, so that is, uh, in summary, the, uh, the overall work that was completed and submitted to you, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity uh, to continue, uh, Moffat and Nickel, to continue to be involved in working on these assignments with the city, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions? Dick? Uh, a couple of questions and I guess a couple of comments. I, I want you to go back to a couple of slides, if you would. Uh, on birth two, Yes, sir. Uh, you're showing gangways. One of the gangways is coming off. It's actually page 34 in your presentation. Uh, that gangway going off right, that one there. Mm -hmm. What you're doing is you're splitting, I guess, the traffic off quite a ways apart. So you're going to break up a lot of, going to take a lot of extra space in there for bus traffic. And I'd like, whoever's going to design the docks, I'd like for them to consider that gangway coming back the other direction. Coming back into this direction? Yes. Okay. And that'll, you won't have to put as much wood down there if you don't want to, but as we design them, let's look at that in cahoots with the city so that we can decide mm -hmm. which way should that gangway go off. Okay. Because I think we're better off putting them just a little closer together. And I think the reason, and, and I'll defer to Sean, that the reason for that, that angle is so that we can allow for uh, vehicular access onto the pontoons, especially an emergency vehicle. Uh, and, and given that angle, that gives the right amount of, of slope to allow that to occur. Is that correct, Sean? Uh, and the turning radius. And the turning radius associated with any kind of vehicle that needs to get out onto that platform. Yeah, they can come in from the other way with the same length of ramp, too. So that's all I'm saying is sure. when Sean designs that dock before you do anything, we need to know which way we want that to go. I'm not complaining about the length of it. I'm just saying it go the other way. Yeah, well, absolutely. And that, that way you're actually driving straight onto it rather than you having to go up there and loop back into it. Okay. Good point. Um, then on uh, go to dock three, and we know we're going to learn a lot this summer off of dock three just because we got the big ship coming in. Mm-hmm. But I, I have several concerns. One is that double line of buses you got there. They're going to end up having to straddle or do something with a gap in the dock and the sidewalk right now because that is not tied together. Okay. And so you may not even have a – you may have a structural problem. The second one is you double-deck those buses like that, and, and that means you've just locked in five buses. Yeah, that, that's always the challenge with, you know, this is the most efficient way to park buses, but you're right. Uh, if, if this guy has loaded and is ready to go, uh, they have to wait, and they have to wait until the buses in front yeah. of them are, are ready to go. Um, and uh, even looking at birth two, that's why we did have a solution uh, that allows for a subtle angling of buses, but you really don't have that. The, even the, the space to accomplish that. You don't, you accomplish don't have that, that chance here. The other mm -hmm. one is that buses line up along the Tongas Trading Store building there. Yeah. There's not enough room to get by, and we've never been able to park alongside that dock 
they usually stop right at the beginning of the building there at the end. Right here. So those three buses mm -hmm. behind there don't, they just won't work. Okay. Um, the other one in talking to a number of the, the people that use Dock 3 is there's a high degree of concern, and, and we all know it, of losing spaces. Yes. And well, hopefully over the next couple of years before we do anything, to me what I've told people is we're going to have a public meeting with you guys and figure this out. We're not going to come pound on your head, and I don't have any intentions of doing that. So this is a starting point for us, but it's got some real problems. And, and we'll find out this summer how well we get by with the bliss because they're going to have to be staged off dock and then pulled into it in a line. So it's, it's, it's an issue. It'll have to leave it alone for now, but it's an issue. The other one I would say is that in talking to some of the people down there primary, we talked about angle parking, and every one of them said to me, can't we angle park? It's too doggone hard getting in and out of here. And so I think when we have our public meetings with them, we ought to talk with them and see if they still consider that. We may be able to angle park irregardless of the bus situation and make it safer and easier to get in and out. And I think they may agree to losing a couple of parkings, 10 or something like that, if we can angle park it. That's our problem. So anyway, we can work that out. Um, and we do have some some earlier sketches that we can resubmit yeah, to show I, angle parking and yeah. the efficiencies that yeah. were created um, associated with yeah. that. And our public works people can work mm -hmm. out the right angle and how far we can get. Um, the other one, I, I guess I'd like to thank you for, you know, all the work you've done, even though some of it has probably got some issues that we've got to look out for. But in my opinion, we're going to spend probably $40 million getting one and two, the new pontoons and all that stuff out there going. And this right here is a good issue, but it's a secondary issue. So I don't even, I'm not worried about it until we get some more experience on three. And personally, I don't care for the wooden floors up there. I think in the long run, they're going to be uh, maintenance hazards and everything else. But anyway, uh, the other comment I'm going to make is that uh, if you go to dock four, uh, the main thing that I worry about on four is that uh, we, we're we talking about the property to the I guess it would be the northwest of the mm -hmm. primary dock right now. And I think my, I'm going to make a mo motion that we take that clear out of your report because we're not in the mode of purchasing private property, taking it off the rolls and so forth. And if we even mention it, all of a sudden value goes up. And right now we don't need it. So I don't think we should be referencing it in the report at all. And uh, it, actually my personal belief is if we get – work with the dock company and get the rest of the parking lot done, and that's going to be more than adequate for what our needs are. And I not have to worry about removing more private property off the road. So anyway, those are my comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Bob? Yeah, I have to agree with Dick on the, on the wood. We spent years and years and years trying to get rid of wooden docks to go to concrete docks because they were less maintenance. Um, and those those surfaces, I know the stuff down by the statue seems to be working out, but they get slippery. They're going to have maintenance issues, et cetera, et cetera. So I would think twice about before we go there. And in regards to this birth four thing, I mean, that's all private property up above, and I'm not uh, too enthusiastic about spending a lot of money developing their property, uh, which they could do anything they want with after the fact. So, um, and then on birth three, if you go yep, back to that, up. we know that that's going to be very challenging. And some of the stuff that was brought up with the fact that the promenade runs into that, and you have the lightering in, and then you have the uh, birth three ramp itself coming up. And since, you know, it seems like when we're talking parking and everything, money's not as much of an object, maybe we want to take that pavilion down and provide for better uh, pedestrian access. Because it's kind of gummed up the way it is, it, I don't think it's necessarily used that well, um, and it would offer us a better uh, option for pedestrian traffic and maybe some of the vendor booths. I don't know, but um, Good point. it's not being used. I'm sure. Must be, you know. Yeah. 
And, and it may be able, I mean, looking at it, it probably can be dismantled and remantled someplace else if that's a, a potential for it. Give us more room. And then uh, I know it's a lot of this is providing parking for buses, but the bus companies today, and I think they will in the future, they can do some off-site staging and bring them in in a timely manner as they fill them up. And so, uh, you know, I think we focus a little too much on trying to put all the buses on a dock. I don't know what the parking number is right now. Uh, how many buses are we parking on all the docks? Uh, the current uh, the current configuration? No, and the one that you're proposing. <laughs> so on this one, I believe we're showing. Oh, it's not on the slide there. I think it's 19 total. On, on birth three. On birth three, yeah. And you got two. And then we have 21 on uh, birth one, and then we have another 10 on birth two. Okay. Yeah. So we're providing parking. That's a lot of buses. That's a lot of buses. It is. And, and, and that's not our main focus right now. Our main focus, and I know that we got to get them on and off, but I think there's some opportunities for staging buses and, and not having the congestion. And like Dick said, when you start locking them up that way, it doesn't become very efficient. Mm -hmm. And we use we use the bus almost as a stamp in this location, bus, a van, a mini. But, yeah, I mean, I think as you see even this coming season, what's demanded by the Breakaway Plus, the Breakaway being there, how many buses that it's going to utilize, um, that it might wind up being a little bit less. And your idea of marshalling, I mean, that, that does happen in many other locations, that there's radio dispatch and that you marshal from another location. And I think that we can do a lot in the, the first couple of seasons with paint. Because it's easier to change that than mm -hmm. just the, the investment in a lot of the other things. So just just a thought. Yeah. The, only, the wood piece. If you're looking at so I just what you use on the uh, walking area, that might be a better. Um, yeah, because it's not as slick. And, yeah. And I actually I was talk. Yeah, I was talking to somebody in Juno, and they like ours better because. They, they do the same thing in the wintertime. They'll go use it. But it's theirs is out of regular wood, and it's mm -hmm. extremely slippery mm -hmm. versus the uh, – and although it is expensive. So. We – you know, we – and, and, and this has been an ongoing discussion early on in the process. You know, some like the wood, some don't like the wood. And I do think early on a determination in, in the design process. If, if it, we believe it adds a texture and it and also sort of creates a zone that's, you know, very obvious that this is where pedestrians can be. And it's sort of representational of the history of Ketchikan. But I think to really test and have the designer sort of, you know, as you were saying, what did Juno do versus what Catch versus other, and, and get some samples and, and, and really test out even like a sample square for a year and see how it, how it wears, could be very beneficial to the long term if that investment's going to be made. Any other questions? Dave? This section might be for Carl, really, for, 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 for you. Um, our agreement with KDC on birth four, does it commit us to any uplands thing at all? Or what or does it mean? What was what was that? Here? Uh, I'm the sorry. Birth, for, for birth form. You're talking birth, about our, our current lease. Agreement? Our current lease does, 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 does it commit us to any up and no, nothing other than there that's there now. Right. right. Yeah, because all that property above the buses is all private. Well, I like this, but you know, I'm not. Yeah. That's, that's their property. They, yeah. They, 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 frankly, they should have paved that years ago. Yeah. Any other questions? This, this will be more suggestive versus prescriptive at this point, but maybe, uh, you know, it'll... Uh... I'm sure they'd love it if we paid for it. <laughs> so, if, if I may, this this is a good first start, but we've only cracked this up to um, Front Street, right? Or, I mean, we, we haven't... First, we haven't, yeah. oh, yeah. we, we haven't figured out what's going to happen as they move into the exactly. uh, inner parts of the city. And I, I think that's another discussion or another process that we have to go through because we may be able to get them off the dock and to the sidewalk, but what happens next? Exactly. <laughs> you know, what happens exactly. next? Does, does, does Front Street then just become a large crossing area? But Yeah, I think this is a, uh, gives us a good idea of what's coming and, and how we're going to manage some of the stuff on the port itself. But as a community, we got to figure out what's going to happen.
Yeah, do we need those crossing lights then? <laughs> Does anybody else have a question? <laughs> Dick, did you have something? No, I only wanted to, I don't know, don't know what we want to do here because I, I want us to take that property north west of the Dock four property off the out of this report, and do I need to get four hands, or is there does anybody not agree with me? It, we're no, we're no, giving we a bad do, perception. I, don't, I wasn't planning to do anything. I mean, we got to get birth one and birth two approved before we even consider this stuff. So I hope we just focus on dealing. Well, with I think we're focused on it, but I'm saying I don't think we should put it in this report. Okay. I'm asking the contractors yeah. if we got four hands Make to take a it motion. out. Uh, I move that we take the, the property to the north west of the current birth four off of the private property. It, if you want to use the word, it's the uh, Talbots and and uh, the guys on the corner, uh, Garnet's property. We have a second. Second. Who didn't second? Call the roll. Severson? Yes. Isom? Yes. Gage? Oh, no. Kuiper? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Flora? Yes. Coos? Yes. Okay, I passed the six to one. We'll eliminate from that. And um, any other questions on this? Thank you, sir. Okay, appreciate it. Thank yes, you. Sir, thank you for your time. <laughs> All right. Let's get some glasses. All right, that takes us to new business 7A3, budget transfer, change order one, final, the contract 1726, birth three improvements and corrosion protection, Turnigan Marine Construction. <laughs> Can we get someone to turn on the lights, please? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a switch up here, they're outside in the hallway. Thank you were close, Lou. It's okay. Yeah. Oh. Close enough. Turnigan Marine Construction Corporation. Do we have a motion? <laughs> Turn the lights back off. <laughs> <laughs> so moved. Your yeah, Honor, I'm going to City Council approve change order number one final in the amount of two hundred forty-three thousand two hundred twenty-six sixty-two. The contract seventeen twenty-eight for three improvements, corrosion protection between the City of Ketchikan and Turning and Marine Construction Corporation, bringing the total contract uh, amount to three million one hundred thirty-eight thousand two hundred twenty-six dollars and sixty-two cents. Authorize the budget transfer in the amount of 108944 from appropriate reserves to the Port Enterprise Fund to the Port Department of Birth 3 Improvement and Barge Overhaul Capital Account. Approve funding from the Port Department of Birth 3 Improvement and Barge Overhaul Capital Account and direct the city manager to execute the change order on behalf of the city council. Second. Good in second, Bob. Yeah, there was a, there was some issues here. I talked to Carl a little earlier about it, and then we'll be talking again about it in um, regards to the birth three. But as you see there, we negotiated a deal for um, leaving the barge there uh, as a breakwater for twelve thousand um, dollars a day, and then um, when it didn't get delivered back, uh, the shipyard had a. A delay of about five days, and we charge them a thousand dollars a day, <laughs> liquidated damages. So, <laughs> and, and Carl, I mean, you know, sometimes our education is expensive, and there was no, I, I, I can't really point fingers or make fault of it. It's just the fact that we didn't catch it, and, and I'm sure that'll never happen again. But um, <laughs> it, it's to the tune of, you know, yeah, fifty-five thousand. Um, but uh, I think that uh, we're moving forward and, and we'll get through it. All right, anybody else? Call the roll. Uh, uh, Kuiper? Yes. Gage? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Flora? Yes. Isom? Yes. Severson? Yes. Coos? Yes. Okay, that passes 7 nothing. brings us down to new business 784. Amendment number one to contract 1716 planning and permitting for removal of birth to Rock Pinnacle, Moffat, and Nickel. Do we have a motion? Your Honor. Go ahead. I move the City Council approve amendment one in the amount of $23,089 to contract number 1716 design of planning and permitting for the removal of 
birth to Rock Pinnacle between the city and Moffat and Nickel, bringing the total contract amount to $363,244. Authorized funding from the Port Department's Rock Pinnacle Removal Capital Account and direct the city manager to execute the amendment on behalf of the city council. Second. Second. Moved and second. Anybody have anything? Dick? Yeah, a couple of questions. I, as I read this, I think this cost is mainly because we're going to put the two permitting things together. Correct. Okay, then the second one is, um, I can't remember now whether, we, we were trying to get the pinnacle done before to get the docks done. Is this going to change any completion dates at all or delay us? Because I'm getting the impression that they're going to be blowing the rock at the same time we're putting in. Uh, new docks out there and I can see issues but anyway help me out Port and Harbor's director Steve Corpron um, I'll answer the second question first um, we originally had hoped that this coming winter we would be able to be working on the rock pinnacle removal but when it was determined that it was going to have to be drilled and blasted as the most cost effective way to do it um, that throws it into a whole other level of permitting and, uh, in the process and it, it's going to require a lot more work to get it permitted probably a lot more cost in monitoring than that during the actual work and in our pre-application teleconferences with both the Corps and the National Marine Fisheries personnel uh, there's, there's no way the pinnacle was going to go this year in fact there's a chance the pinnacle is going to could slow down a merged project so they have assured us if we submit a combined application, we can divorce them later this year or early next year if it looks like for some reason the pinnacle is going to slow it down. Um, what we don't want to do is give the impression that the pinnacle is not necessary by divorcing them if we do that. Um, we've talked to the sea pilots about it. Um, with the expansion, we, it really makes getting the pinnacle out of there critical, but they are willing to live with it for a year or so if it, if, if it doesn't go the same time that one and two goes. Um, because, you know, the number of the largest ships coming in, won't, you know, it's only going to be one or two more a year that rotate in. Um, and they're willing to endure, to endure basically. Uh, but we don't want to give the impression that, well, it's not necessary if, if they, if we expand one and two and the pinnacle doesn't go for a, until a year after that, that all oh, well, and then it's not necessary. You know, they can, they can do with the pinnacle still there. So in our discussions with the Coast Guard as well, you know, we've made it clear that, you know, it's still part of the project. And the Corps is looking at all these. They're even rolling birth four into the kind of the overall master plan. Uh, even though birth four's permit is under review right now, they are they are making sure that one and two and the pinnacle are all part of the discussion as as they work on the approval for birth four, because they see it as all one large project, the expansion of birth one, two, three, and four, removal of the, the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. So the first question. Um, when we came to you a month or two ago, you know, to get you know, a decision that it looks like drilling and blasting is being the most cost effective. We wanted your blessing on going that direction. Uh, there was an acknowledgement at that time that, yeah, we would be coming back to you with a contract amendment for the increased uh, effort to get drilling and blasting permitted. Um, the net increase is 23,000 uh, because we have a credit of 55,000 due to the, the the lesser amount of drilling they were able to do because it was such a hard rock pinnacle out there. So, Okay, I, I guess part of my concern, we start rolling all these things into one giant plan and I can see the federal government, more delays and more coordination and all that. So I, what I'm hoping is that if the contractor has a problem and sees delays because of bureaucracy, that they will keep us up to date because I think we've got some people back in D.C. that may help us. Um, and, I, and I don't hesitate to use them. Right. The, the, the feds in this case are, are the Corps and the National Marine Fisheries, and we've had pre-application teleconferences with both. Um, and they're the ones that are kind of encouraging us for a streamlining purpose and to make it easier to get it all approved to merge these two applications. 
Um, and they've also taken the step of they have already assigned um, the person that will be reviewing it is, is going to be the same for each one of these projects, including the Birth 4 project. And it's a person that we have worked very well with at the core over the last several years. Uh, we haven't worked with her this last year because she was on maternity leave, but she's back now. Um, and she's been very, very common sense to work with. Um, so, you know, so I was thrilled when they, when they, because usually you submit your application, you don't know who you're going to get. And you might have three projects with them. You have three different people you're working with. Mm -hmm. So when they told us they were going to, that this person was going to get all these projects, including the birth full one they're reviewing now, I, would, I was absolutely thrilled to hear that. So. Well, I'm just worried about delays, and we can't afford them. So. Right. Any other questions? Yeah, Bob. Yeah, I, uh, when I first read this, I, you know, they said some fis efficiencies, um, but I don't know what success we've had. They say it's going to make it easier and this kind of stuff. So what's the trigger that's going to pull this thing apart if it's not working? What What's going to make you say, okay, we're, we're going to split? If it, probably National Marine Fisheries, if it if it if their review looks like it's going to be delayed on the pinnacle and based on that's going to be a much more um, what's the word I'm looking for not, a, not abusive but uh, contentious. It, it, yeah, contentious or, or intense the activities the, the sounds the, the, the potential detriment to marine mammals and so as, as they get into um, reviewing what our consultants have put together as far as their um, assumptions and the data that they've assembled, uh, which we feel is very conservative, um, as long as, as they agree with that, uh, we should be fine. If they if they think it's going to be even worse than what we think is already a conservative estimate on what the impacts are going to be, uh, that's where it, it could get delayed if they want to do some, some kind of study or monitoring beforehand. Uh, it, it, it could get a little rough, but... The, the discussions we had them were good. We had people from D.C. on the line as well as the local, you know, local, the Alaska National Marine Fisheries people. Uh, it, it was a good dialogue. I, I was very, very pleased with how both teleconferences went. Um, and I think they were pleased with the amount of effort that our team has already put in bringing to the table. Um, and we think it's going to be all right, an eight to nine month review process. Uh, but the wild card is if the pinnacle gets a little contentious, but they assured us that we could we could, dive, you know, divorce them if we had to later. Um, and then um, are these through separate uh, funding sources? We're we using different funds for the pinnacle than what we are for the port. For um, for the for the planning and permitting and design, uh, it's all out of the port enterprise fund. Um, and I, uh, some of, we have two million coming from the state for the Pinnacle project, so uh, I think that's going to be mostly for removal. I, I think we've got out of the Port Enterprise Fund, we've already got this covered. So you know, th yeah, there's no federal money involved in this. Well, I would just want to make sure that we didn't have you know uh, two separate funding sources that can make it a uh, financial nightmare to try to keep up with everything. <laughs> no, we're good. Okay, good. All right, Dave. Um, I guess something else to keep in mind, too, and you, you said our relationship with the Corps seems to be okay now, or at least better than it has been in the past. Um, this may seem a strange thing to keep in mind, but I know in the past there have been s quite a few local projects that have been kiboshed simply by changes in a, cha changes over in, in who, who's, who's doing the Alaska region. And I know that at one point they were, they were, sh they were moving up to blood like every two years. And you get near the end, the end of someone's term, and all of a sudden the project would stop dead until a new person was on. So I'm just curious, just to say, it might not be good. Is it, is it, are, are we going to have this guy or woman who approves in charge of the court in Alaska? Are they going to be there for a while, or is, is there a potential uh, changeover coming up? Because that, that's a really kind of washed law project. No, the staff officer they just assigned to this just got back from maternity leave. Not, I don't I'm, think she has any plans to. To, to go anywhere right now. I'm not worried about her. I'm worried about the colonel or whoever who, who's, who's in charge of Because that's been the problem in the past. In the bureau, we had several projects that get basically stopped because, oh, new colonel's coming in. He needs to look at things and, you know, no. months would go by. Uh, understood. Um, our experience uh, 
in the last six or seven years has been very positive, uh, and especially working with this off or this this staff person. Um, and I think it's a mutual um, admiration because we've been very honest with her, uh, and we've never held back. And I, I think if you get caught, you know, trying to with you know, oh, oh oh yeah, we didn't tell you about that. You know that that yeah, that screws you up for years. But no, we've been very open with her on all of our projects, and and she's been very easy to work with and giving us suggestions on how to get this done, how to get that done. Um, so, like I said, when I when I found out that not only were we getting her for this, but for like all of the projects that we're looking at right now, that that's never happened before. So that really that really was a good feeling to get. All right, Dick. One more. Can we expect some type of routine, like say quarterly, since you're talking about nine months of playing and playing this game, report to this body so we know where we're at? We can do that. That's okay. Not a problem. Excellent. All right. Did you want to add anything? It just in, I completely support everything Steve said, and he was on the uh, on the call with us, uh, both calls with the agencies, and um, we we start off with the agencies very positively with these pre-application meetings. We acknowledge them in words to them on the meeting that we you know respect them as as fellow professionals in the process of trying to get to yes on a project, and then throughout the process we act in a way that we actually believe that because we do believe that and. Um, the submission of the permit application, which we're coming up on uh, fairly shortly, um, does not th that neither ends the process nor puts it into a black box. That opens the discussion. And so, in uh, you know, in response to to your question, Bob, um, the um, as the agencies get involved in re reviewing the permit during the time that they have to do that, the questions that come back are going to be very uh, clearly. Uh, related to the uh, in-water work for the piling versus the pinnacle. And it's at that time that we're going to be able to, you know, talk to the agencies and say, hey, it's it looks like there's a lot of questions or concerns here, or maybe you're pushing back for additional study or something. Is this a good time to be thinking about the pinnacle in a future year as opposed to as part of the project? So we're going to maintain that dialogue throughout, and uh, there will be every indication of, of whether we should separate that out or, or leave it detached. Nick? I had one more thing to add just really quick. Um, the the federal people we were talking to, they're the ones that encouraged another reason for merging them to is to strengthen the case for removing the pinnacle. Because, you know, there might be some pushback from some groups that say, no, we don't want to do that to, to disturbance. But if we tie it to the expansion of Birth 1 and 2, which is actually the driving force for finally getting this done, marrying the application strengthens that argument for the pinnacle. Uh, but my question was that uh, are we having to deal with three or four different agencies as different entities, or have they got it into a, one permit and they're all and they're working together rather than separately? Because I've, I've heard some comments from DC coming out that the president wants this to be somebody's in charge of that permit and everybody else helps get it done. They don't take it and run with it themselves. So right. I don't know where we're at. The, the permit application officially goes to the Corps. They staff it out to NIMS and the Coast Guard and, and other agencies in that. To make things go smoothly, we engage the other agencies before we even submit it. That's the purpose of these pre-application teleconferences. And we've been working the Coast Guard as well through my contacts there. So that um, – but so the Corps gets the application, you know, officially. Then they uh, staff it out officially to Coast Guard, NIMS, and those – those reports go back to the court, and the core is the one that issues the permit. But if if, you, if you're playing, if you're playing the game properly, you're engaging all of them. But officially, it's through the core to the others. Anybody else? Thank you, Steve. Yes, sir. <coughs> hey, call the roll. Sievertson. Yes. Isom. Yes. Gage. Yes. Kiefer. Yes. Zingy. Yes. Flora. Yes. Cuse. Yes. That has the seven to nothing. You know, once we get rid of that, we might find some new king salmon or something. Floating <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. Uh, that brings us down to 7A5 uh, Amendment Number 1, Contract 1736, Birth 3, Barge Overhaul, Vigor, Alaska, LLC. Do we have a motion? Your Honor, I move the City Council also the City Manager to execute the change order number one of the contract number 1736 with Vigor, Alaska, LLC. For birth three barge overhaul in the amount of fifty-eight thousand two hundred and seven dollars, 
with funding being taken from the approved project contingency for a new total contract amount of 1,946,305. We have a second. Second. Moved and second. Bob, you want to add anything? Uh, you know, as you look up there, we, we're having some problem with the coding, and we're going to withhold some payment on that. Um, and, and you know, I was wondering if, if some of this could be involved in that. But um, I have to say, I went down and looked at the, the birth three today, and, and I'm a little disappointed in the, its appearance. Now, it may have integrity and. In, in what's underneath the water and everything else, but this thing just come out of a shipyard, and um, it, 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 it needs a lot more work. So uh, I was disappointed in that. Anybody else? Call roll. Flora? Yes. Coos? Yes. Isom? Yes. Sievertson? Yes. Kiefer? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Gage? Yes. Yeah. Hey, that passes seven to nothing. It brings us down to seven, eight, nine. Award of Contract 1812 Solid Waste Building Package, PK Builders. We have a motion. Your Honor, I move the City Council accept the bid of PK Builders in the amount of $650,750. For contract number 18-12 Solid Waste Building Package, establish a 10% contingency in the amount of $65,075, bringing the total project cost to $715,825. Authorized funding from the Solid Waste Division's 2018 Solid Waste Building and Design Capital Account and direct the City Manager to execute the contract documents on behalf of the City Council. Second. second. Moved and second. And this is to expand our um, facility up there on the hill. Um, Dave, did you have anything you wanted to add? I need to know your honor. Just, we need this apparently, so. Anybody else? Call the Kiefer? Yes. Gage? Yes. Isom? Yes. Sievertson? Yes. Coos? Yes. Flora? Yes. Zingy? Yes. All right, that brings us over to KPU. We got um, V1, Southeast Power Agency update. Trey, you're on. Somewhere. You actually can feel electricity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I feel something, man. <laughs> it's that, was, that was joy. Yeah, we're back on it. Okay, we're back on. Go ahead, Trey. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Your Honor, and uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Council Members, and uh, Mr. Amelot. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, start the first of a continuous series of quarterly meetings uh, at the request of my board. Um, they've requested that I address all three of uh, SEPA's member communities on a quarterly basis. So I used to send out a flyer, and now I'll be doing those in person. Uh, I noticed you had a fairly long agenda today, so I did cut out about half of my slides. And so some of the things that I have uh, I hear out in the community, um, some of the um, social media feedback and things like that, uh, it, it makes me realize that, that we, as partners in this, um, ha have a lot of work ahead to, to help educate uh, the, the general public on what we do and, um, and, and some of the nuances that go with that. It's a complicated business, and uh, sometimes things uh, get conveyed. Um, and so I'm going to uh, utilize these quarterly meetings to hopefully kind of chip away at that. And, uh, and work with you folks to, to improve that. So I'd like to start with uh, um, a brief overview of SEPA. I do this at most presentations just to, for the folks that are listening that may not be that familiar with our organization. 
So SEPA is a regional joint action agency. We're a not-for-profit. We're essentially a wholesale GMT, which is a generation and transmission entity. Um, typically power companies, uh, there's three facets, generation, transmission, and distribution. We do the first two, and we deliver the power to the front door of Petersburg and Wrangell and Ketchikan, and then they distribute that power. Um, along with some, some of those entities also have their own generation. The SEPA board is governed by municipal appointed directors. Uh, several of you uh, that serve on the council have served on the SEPA board. And uh, we thank you for your service. Financially and legally separated from the municipalities. Uh, so that's, that's a big advantage and one of the reasons why SEPA was, uh, was developed is to shift some of those exposures over to an independent agency. So um, if we go out and uh, bond for a large project, for instance, that doesn't impact uh, the city's ability to bond for their uh, various projects. Also, if uh, there's a large loss, uh, SEPA is on the hook for that, and uh, not the municipalities uh, or the rate payers. SEPA's wholesale power rate is 6.8 cents. Um, that's been constant for uh, over 20 years now. I think that there's a lot to be said about that. Uh, I can't, if I think really hard, I might be able to come up with one or two things that haven't changed in price for 20 years, but there's not very many. And, and also, uh, last year, as many years, we, we've issued rebates back to the member utilities. Last year, we issued a $2.7 million rebate. And what that did, in effect, is lower the wholesale power rate to five cents. So let's discuss SEPA owned and managed facilities. Um, SEPA has assets greater than half a billion dollars in replacement value. And like I was saying earlier, that's one of the liabilities that was shifted over to SEPA. Um, we own two hydro projects, the Swan Lake and the Taiyi Lake. They were built by the state back in the early 80s. Projects are about 35 years old now. So as that half a billion dollars in assets starts to age, there's quite a bit of investment to keep that up. We anticipate probably close to $200 million of uh, renewal and replacement activities over the next 20 or so years. SEPA owns and operates 175 miles of transmission. We have four submarine cable crossings, associated marine terminals, substations, switchyards, and all the typical electrical apparatus. The operators at TIE are SEPA employees and have been for the last three years. The operators at Swan Lake are through a O&M agreement with KPU. So this is always a helpful map, if you could see the top of it. So this is uh, SEPA's, SEPA's interconnected system. And I think the biggest takeaway I like folks to get from this is there's less than 12,000 meters combined on the whole region that, that SEPA serves. Well, I'm going to adjust this just a little. So, uh, that didn't work so well with the last bottle. Yeah, now we're cut off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What did you win? All right, well, we'll make do we it. We know what Peter's been doing. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. We know it's not there somewhere. Those barbarians in the Thanks for your patience. Uh, so, only 12,000 meters on the whole system. So think about that when we go to uh, have to do a uh, new generation. If we develop a new project, it might be 100 or $200 million. Um, when we have to replace transmission lines as they age, uh, as we have to replace uh, submarine cables, uh, general infrastructure, um, that's, a, that's an important fact for, for our area. On the map on the right, uh, the red line on that that's the Swan Tai Intertie that was put in in 2009. That connected the Tai project and the Swan Lake project. 
Prior to that, Taiyi served Wrangell of Petersburg, and Swan served Ketchikan. And they were actually operated by the local utilities because when the state owned them, they didn't want to be in the operations business. And, of course, they're all the way up in Anchorage, so it made sense to have the local utilities operate them. And if you see the little red arrows there on, on the depiction uh, coming out of Swan Lake and Taiyi Lake, you can see the STI power flows both directions. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit today because I think there's some misperceptions there, and uh, we hopefully we can clear those up. So, SEPA saves Ketchikan ratepayers money. There are three areas that I want to focus on today. There's a lot of different areas that we do save money, uh, but these are a few that I think are important that are, are salient to the conversation today. Uh, one, we're going to touch on the STI, the Swan Tie Inner Tie. We're also going to talk about the Swan Lake Reservoir expansion and its impacts. And then we're going to talk about op optimizing reservoir management. So, how much power flows over the STI from Taiyi to Ketchikan? I get this question quite a bit. In 2017, the average flow was 3.6 megawatts. And when we talk about megawatts, a lot of people don't um, quite understand uh, some of those terms in the electric industry. So, I've also put this in terms of what that means in displaced diesel for Ketchikan. So Taiyi displaced approximately $9.5 million in Ketchikan diesel in 2017. Without it, you would have had to replace that power with something else. In 2018, year to date, just from the first of the year, the STI is averaged about 5.68 megawatts. And that's the equivalent of a little bit over $4.5 million in diesel. So the origin of power uh, that comes from SEPA to Ketchikan essentially has these two sources. Blue is Swan Lake, and the orange is Taiyi. And this is just a different way to show those calculations I was just showing you uh, with regard year-to-date 2018. Now, I'd heard things that, uh, um, well, we're shipping all of our power uh, north, uh, while you guys are burning diesel. And um, so this next slide will help clarify that a little bit. And I think that rumor started uh, because uh, Wrangell was having a water shortage up, up north, but the water shortage was potable water. It doesn't have anything to do with power generation. So I think some folks got confused. And this is a breakdown per month. Uh, April's just a partial month. but And once again, the orange is uh, power flowing from Taiyi, and you can see consistently um, we have quite a bit of power coming from Taiyi. So, benefits of the Swan Lake Reservoir expansion. In the first year alone, which was a dry year, we only got 6.6 .6 feet up on the flashboard array, and uh, so we didn't capture as much spill as we anticipate to get on average, but even in the first year, we saved $1.1 million equivalent of KPU diesel generation. That's pretty good. We actually expect, on average, we'll probably get about double that, and in some good years, we'll get three or four times that. So let's talk for a minute about the Swan Lake Reservoir, and there's two areas I want to focus on. One is uh, upper circle, right-hand corner, um, right on that line there uh, is 330. That's the, uh, the old spill elevation for Swan Lake. And on the yellow line on the graph, um, the next slide I'll show is, is where we captured the additional energy in Swan Lake with the, uh, with the reservoir rays. And then a little later, I'm going to talk about drafting the reservoirs. And a little bit how SEPA approaches that and, and really what the value is. So this, these are those peaks that were depicted on the yellow line in the graph and just shows you how much we captured and that's all, that's all energy that in previous years would have gone over the spillway and we would have lost forever. 
we're now able to capture that. So what's the value of drafting Swan Lake toward the design limit? First of all, it reduces the diesel generation required. It lowers the diesel surcharge for the ratepayers. It lowers overall O&M costs on the KPU diesels. It lowers the carbon emissions. And it creates more reservoir storage. As I'll show here in a minute, we'll see what the value is as you uh, draft harder. And when I say use the term draft, that means how much water you use out of the reservoir. And I got a note here at the bottom, and, and I'd encourage folks just to think about this a little bit. Um, in, in my opinion, our hydro resources should not be used as contingency for diesel. That's upside down and backwards for me. Really, hydro is too valuable to do that. And I'm going to show you the value of hydro with the next slide. This one gets a little bit busy. But I'll step you through it and try to keep it fairly simple. So the green line at the bottom is the operations plan draft limit elevation of 272 that the SEPA board every year votes on and agrees and gives direction to staff to manage the reservoir to that, whatever level is decided on that year. The red line is, I'll say in some ways, historically where, where KPU has started burning diesel. And this year they put in a request to start burning diesel at 285. That's 13 feet above where my direction from the SEPA board is to manage the rev reservoirs too. So we had several discussions with KPU. And just so folks know, we don't operate in a vacuum. SEPA actually facilitates weekly meetings with all three municipalities and their electrical departments. And we plan how, um, how much power is dispatched, the load tables, and all these other attributes. We discuss lake levels, weather impacts, uh, maintenance. This happens every single week. So in this instance, we encourage KPU um, to keep drafting. And, uh, and that was uh, a challenge. But at the end of the day, we ended up drafting to 276 feet. What's that worth? So this is the cost per feet when you get down into the lower levels of the lake. By us doing, and for people that may not be able to see the numbers on the graph, it's about 110 to 115 thousand dollars per foot. So we ended up drafting nine additional feet this year, which saved in excess of a million dollars. And then if the reservoir refills in the next water cycle, we'll actually impound an additional million dollars worth of water. So the impact could be as high as $2 million for drafting a little bit deeper this year. And we're still drafting above the design criteria of the engineers that designed the plant. Okay? So there's a lot of benefits on how we manage the reservoirs. And this is, these are just a couple of areas that SEPA foc has focused on. And I threw this one in here because I'm sure some folks are interested on where the lake levels currently are for Tai. And the green line is so far this year. And the dashed line is the guide curve. So in the ops plan, we establish a guide curve. And as that means, it's a guide. And we can adjust that throughout the year. The draft limit is the lower level, then, and that's a, um, and we can't go beyond that. So, um, as you can see, we're drafting this thing very consistently going down, and obviously, uh, Tai Lake Reservoir 
is a dedicated resource for the northern communities, and, uh, and then KPU uh, can take additional power. So we don't want to run the northern communities dry in Taiyi. So SEPA is always trying to balance, trying to sell as much power down here to, to KPU without running the northern communities short. And as you know, that's hard. We don't, we don't control the weather. We don't control the timing of the inflows. We don't even control the loads. Uh, so I think we're doing a really good job. And I think the few examples I offered there uh, demonstrates uh, some significant savings over the years. Um, and this is, uh, we do this day in and day out. We eat and breathe this stuff. So I just want to reassure uh, the folks here that SEPA is working hard behind the scenes to bring the highest value that we can to the, the member utilities um, without undue risk, um, but also, uh, you know, we want to maximize our hydro resources. <coughs> You'd be better off, as, as I demonstrated there, where potentially we're leaving a million dollars in Swan Lake every year. Um, because we're afraid that there's going to be a potential failure in the diesels. And really, it would be better off to spend a little bit more money, make sure your diesels are reliable, and use them for the backup to hydro. Over time, that will pay larger benefits to the community. Be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Trey? Dick? Yeah, Trey, you used that thing up there of about a million dollars that was in Swan Lake of diesel and since we used out of Swan Lake we paid SEPA what is it 6.8 cents mm -hmm. probably averages out you said to five after we get a rebate so I don't know what I don't know what you're figuring diesel cost per kilowatt but 30 it's based on 30 cents of kWh so that means I save 25 cents a kilowatt by getting by using SEPA power versus burning diesel, and I think that's a figure the public going to understand more than anything. If I, whatever my bill is for that period that diesel is being burned, it's costing me what six seven times if it's running diesel. And if we got water, we need to use the water to whatever your plan is. So anyway, that's. That to me is what's most important. Yeah, and that's I was trying to put it in terms people can understand. And we, you know, we can debate it whether that's twenty-eight cents or whatever, or thirty, or you know, and so it's loaded labor and, and the cost of you have maintenance on your diesels and and you have to go hire, you know, you have to not hire, but you have to shift people over to work on them. And I mean, there's there's some costs involved there. Um, one big thing is is that you won't you won't use up your diesels as much, and your O and M will be reduced. Because, um, as you guys know, that uh, that that does take its toll on on diesels. Yeah. So, uh, to the mayor. Go ahead. Um, so the design curve that you had shown there is is that, and you say the, the board votes on it every year. Is that what the, what we decide we're going to draft it to? Is that the the bottom line for the reservoirs? Uh, as engineered, are we above what's engineered, and we just put a safety factor so in or gonna, anything like that? I'm going to go up to Swan Lake here because it's more relevant for you guys here. So, in this particular depiction, uh, and this year, the we knew we were going to be short on water this year. So, uh, I believe last year the the board approved drafting to 273. This year, we requested 272. And the design um, minimum criteria is 27, um, excuse me, 271.5. Um, so we're close. And, you know, I was, I was just happy that we worked together this year and we were able to burn a little bit more water um, without undue risk. And it ended up saving the ratepayers a million dollars. At least, and it might be an additional one if we refill this year. So it's potentially two million dollars savings. Well, I appreciate that, but you know, um, the question is, SEPA's got three customers, so we have eight thousand, and we've just—I think we're probably a little more on the conservative side because mm -hmm. of the customer base that we serve. And so I, I don't know how we balance mm -hmm. and talk through that, but I know that you guys meet every week, and um, 
and we're probably more conservative than, than CIPA is. Well, and, and I think it's understanding the issues a little bit better, too. That's why I'm trying to talk through them a little bit. Um, and, you know, if the CIPA board agrees that they don't want to draft down below 275, that's fine. Put it in the ops plan, and that's what we'll control for. But I'm kind of in this awkward position right now where I've got the SEPA board saying, yeah, it's okay to draft it here. Conditions merit that we need it. We should do it. Um, and we think we can do it safely and very measured approach. Um, but then I'm, I'm having challenges doing that on the other side. So, um, and I think it's just a matter of communicating and understanding the issues a little bit more, um, getting a higher level of confidence. So, uh, if you look at the history that we got this year, it's, I think it'll be helpful for decision making in the in the future as well. Um, because uh, KPU had a diesel down, um, they had a, a hydro project down, uh, so even with that, we were able to do it and, and saved a lot of money for ratepayers. So um, hopefully, that's some some valuable information that we can utilize in the future for decision making. Dave. Yeah, Trey. Um, you said you were looking at $200 million over the next 20 years for capital improvements. Are, the, are those mainly to upgrade and repair existing facilities? Are you looking at other power sources? or where, where, How does that $200 million break out? Sure. Um, it's, it's pretty extensive. So we have a renewal and replacement program that we identify um, life cycles for all the major components uh, in our system on all of our assets. And so there's a few big ticket items. Uh, a couple of those are, uh, are line replacements, uh, pole replacements. They're getting 35 plus years old. Uh, and uh, obviously we go out and test them and stuff. And eventually we'll have to replace those. Um, and then there's just other large infrastructure. So the 200 million is for existing. And uh, one of my uh, future talks, I will uh, address the council on um, future plans and, and decision making with regard to new generation assets and what that potential cost looks like. Uh, right now, I'm working on a, a model, a financial model. What, what it'll take is it'll take, it'll overlay SEPA's current debt and look at what uh, the future looks like as we bring in additional debt and some of the old debt falls off the books. And my goal has always has been to levelize our debt so we don't uh, have this huge bump in rates. And so that will come into then decision making on when do we bring the next asset online and how big and what project that should be. And uh, yeah. Just following up on that, other than the uh, ever popular but probably unrealistic looking at Grace Lake, is there anything out there of any size that in our area that we have a reasonable? likelihood of being able to tap into definitely okay. there's uh in just uh, if 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 it's okay mr mayor I, I could give just a brief yeah. um so sepa has been working on a hydro side evaluation for five years and there's over 60 projects in our region and the corridor we're looking at is a 170 mile five mile uh transmission line corridor about 10 miles on either side of that you get much further away, the economics don't work out because transmission is really expensive. And within that corridor, we've identified probably 20 projects that will raise to the top, and, and we've delved into those very deeply. And right now we're um, in the final uh, uh, throes of analyzing the data and kind of grading those projects. And, and then we'll come back and, and present that to our board and uh, provide some recommendations. Uh, my goal out of that whole process is to give the, the board some choices that maybe we'll, here's a, a small project, um, medium and large, or maybe a, one project that could be staged uh, for stage development so we don't take a, as big a hit on rates. Anybody else? Mark. So I see the inner tie, the power flows both ways. Um, it looks like it's always flowing from Tiny to Swamp, not the other way. So there's certain times that it would flow north, and that would be, for instance, during a maintenance outage where we've taken Tai plant offline to investigate uh, and do some work. Um, and that way, and then we would shift. But in this time frame that you showed us, it was all 
tie you to a song? I'll say all, all, pretty almost. much almost all. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Troy. Um, when are we going to see you again? Another three months? Yes, sir. And four. Well, I've come to the board meeting, you can come see us. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. You bet. Thank, thank you. you. I'm to turn off that light there, Trey. Right. Oh, yeah. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That brings us to 7B4, authorizing staff to discontinue efforts to provide for the sale of telecommunication division and promote, provide written notice of the termination to the brokerage services agreement between the city of Ketchikan, DBA of Ketchikan Public Utilities, and Falkenberg Capital Corporation. We have a motion. Your Honor. Go ahead, Mark. I move the city council authorize staff to discontinue efforts to provide for the sale of the telecommunications division and to provide written notice of the termination of the bro brokerage services agreement between the city of Ketchikan, DBA Ketchikan Public Utilities, and Falkenberg Capital Corporation. Second. Moved and seconded. Um, Mark, did you want to add anything? No, sir. Um, we went My out. mother would be thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> we went out and looked for possibilities, and uh, we're, um, the, the direction of the council is to continue with operating the telecommunications and going forward, and uh, we're not looking to um, um, do any sale, sales. So um, call the roll. I'm sorry, quick waiting for staff. You bet. Um, so, Carl, um, in 10 years, all we have paid Falkenberg is 75000 That's correct. That's a real, I mean, I, I hate seeing money wasted, that's a pretty well, <laughs> that's, that's a relatively cheap retainer, I mean, considering. <laughs> All right. Okay, okay. Call the roll. Goose. Yes. Flora. Yes. Zingy. Yes. Kuiper. Yes. Gage. Yes. Isom. Yes. Sieverton. Yes. Yeah. All right, that passes seven to nothing, brings us down to um, 7B5, resolution 182697, amending the city of Ketchikan compensation plan to provide for the classification of a position of assistant water division manager. Um, do we have a motion? Yeah, Your Honor. Go ahead. I move the city council approve resolution number 182697, amending the city of Ketchikan compensation plan to provide for the classification of the position of assistant water division manager and establish an effective date. Second. Moved and second. Dick, do you have anything to add? Nope. Carl, so this guy will be, we're going to hire a person that will um, eventually take over Mr. Kleiniger's position. That is the intent. And then we will get rid of that assistant position once that's done. That is the intent. That's Thank correct. you very much. Call the roll. Your Honor. Oh, sorry, Bob. Do we have a, uh, has John given us a retirement date? No. So do we know when we're going to hire this person? Uh, I mean, I, I haven't laid out a recruitment plan. Uh, I would anticipate probably within the next six to 12 months. Would be. Okay. I mean, I just, uh, and, and I think that we got to come up with a model for, uh, for doing this, I think, for other departments too. And I don't know what that time period is when we bring this, this person on to have him shadow and work with the, the individual that's retiring. Councilmember Severson, it's it's going to be tough. I'm I'm not going to, uh, uh, you know, try to flower it up. Yeah. Uh, at the last meeting, you asked for a report. Yeah. Um, we sent it sent out an amended version of that report. You not only have key management people who are close or eligible for retirement, you've got a number of people on the line who have a lot of years experience who are similarly eligible for for retirement. Not all those positions unfortunately lend themselves to easy apprentice and bringing them on. There, there's some differences in the program. You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to get this kick started and, and, and we'll see where it goes. I, I certainly appreciate that because I think that um, and, and I read a bunch of stuff in regards to a lot of cities aren't, and so they're going to be in trouble because by 2020, the baby boomers are going to go out of the market, and, and with them, a lot of experience and, and a lot of work ethics that we may not be able to replicate. I, 
I would agree with that, and I'd make one more observation that I think Alaska is going to be particularly challenged in terms of the number of people my age who will be leaving the workforce within the next couple of years. And the fact now that we do not have a defined uh, retirement incentive program for people coming to Alaska. We've lost our competitiveness in terms of what's happening in the lower 48. So between the two, uh, it's going to make it that much more tough. Uh, in our case, I, I can tell you I can't give you a figure because it's been several years since we did our last review of the comp plan, but we, we are no longer competitive. And, and that's another challenge that we're going to have to deal with one way or the other. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be tough. Well, I appreciate you doing this first step here, but I think it's something we've got to keep our eye on and keep moving forward with and come up with a, a, a plan, per se. Um, and I did talk to Carl a little bit about the position in regards to PERS and other things, and they're getting some answers back on that because we, we have that issue. And, and I think if this person that we hire goes into the, uh, the manager's position, PERS is going to follow him. But if he doesn't, then we have a PERS determination uh, issue that we got to deal with and, and payments that go on forever, it seems like. So there's a lot of little things to this that we're going to have to take a look at and try to figure out if there's a better model. And I'd like to see if we can continue that search. Anybody else? Call the roll. Gage? Yes. Kuiper? Yes. Ziggy? Yes. Flora? Yes. Case? Yes. Searton? Yes. Ison? Yes. The best is seven nothing brings us to vouchers. Daily news fifty six hundred seventy two point four three, and All American Auto three hundred eighty three eighty four dollars and forty cents. Do we have a motion? Your Honor, I move for approval of vouchers to catch can Daily News in the amount of five thousand six hundred seventy two dollars and forty three cents, and All American Auto in the amount of three hundred eighty four dollars and forty cents. Do we have a second? Second. All of them. Severson. Yes. Isom? Yes. Gage? Yes. Kuiper? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Flora? I'm staying. Coos? Yes. Okay, that passes 6 one abstention. <laughs> brings us to Carl, your report. Just a couple, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. Um, we've already touched on the, the issue of succession planning, so I won't okay. uh, talk to that. Uh, I did want to give the council a heads up. Council Member Coos brought this to my attention earlier. Uh, regarding a potential issue with uh, Holland America Prince's buses over the next couple of weeks. We are doing some work on uh, Park Avenue in order to allow the buses to do what they need to do in terms of getting drivers trained, that kind of thing. We are going to allow them to use the, the Third Avenue bypass for a limited period of time. So I wanted to, to at least let the council know that. Uh, and we're going to monitor that just to let the council know uh, this summer relative to all the construction activities that are taking place down in the Stedman Street area. Shouldn't we be utilizing the 3rd Avenue during this construction stuff? There's, I don't disagree. Mm -hmm. I've got to do some homework okay. on that relative to, I think, an ordinance that the council okay. previously adopted. Um, and I... And the only thing I've noticed when we have done that is during rush hour, um, when they, everybody gets bottlenecked up at Jefferson and Third. So I will I will take a look at it. Yeah. Um, relative to Mr. Atkinson's uh, presentation, I, I want to assure the council that I probably agree with ninety eight percent. What, what Trey said tonight. Uh, and he's right. We, we did draw the reservoir down to record levels this year. Uh, and he's right. We were probably uh, overly cautious relative to doing that because of the conditions out at Beaver Falls and uh, issues we were having with the diesels. And it's our intent to do a an effective and continuing maintenance uh, program for the diesel, so hopefully we won't be in that situation again. The only comment I would add uh, that I don't think gets enough attention 
the fact that we had the water in the reservoir we did, in part, is attributable to Whitman Lake. And when we operate Whitman, we're, you know, obviously giving a cushion to, to SEPA. And it's no surprise to the council, I still have some heartburn with the true up. And we're still trying to work our way through that issue. And uh, hopefully we'll get there. So that's all I had for tonight. Okay. Uh, any questions, Council? City Clerk's file? Nothing, Your Honor. City Attorney's uh, file? Nothing, Your Honor. Any future agenda items? Mayor, Council comments? Mark? None, Your Honor. Dave? A couple things. Uh, one, I'm looking forward to seeing exactly just what a weeping cedar is. But, uh, you ever heard that phrase? Maybe we're going to have to give people <laughs> umbrellas to be the library. I don't know. Um, the other thing is we heard, we heard some you know, discussion tonight about, about the political one might be a more complicated process than we're looking for, but the good news is, is I've had a whole lot of people say they wanted to pay 20 bucks a pop for a lottery and get to push the button. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Uh, the other one, a little more serious, um, <laughs> as you all know, I'm always looking at uh, people parking around the community and things and things that kind of leap out and whether you know, it's, it's appropriate or not. You probably all noticed over on, on the bypass, there's been an RV parked there for probably not a year, but many, many months. Um, I just kind of was, I reached the point where I wasn't going to worry about it anymore. Just kind of, but now all of a sudden, there's a minivan parked next to it. And even more, today, actually, yes, yesterday, I noticed there was a, a little camp set up and a cook stove and stuff going on. And I don't know, is that our property? Is that is that someone else's property? Who's, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure you want to have like a, an RV park sprout up and we have another 10 city before we know what's going on. So. Port Harbor is director of Steve <laughs> Corporate. It's a little outside my jurisdiction, but yeah. last year that caught my eye as well. It caught Mark's eye. And so we looked into it and it's private property. Is that private property? Yeah, mm -hmm. you'll see there's actually two curb cutouts there yeah. for the driveways for those lots. Um, but yeah, that's, so it, it's, private, it's property. private property. So the fact they're there isn't an issue now. What they're doing, that might be a zoning thing. Well, so I, zoning I, I don't know. But, I don't think we actually but, allow part, you know, um, but it's, um, but it's not city property, okay. that part right there. Thanks. Property owner probably doesn't know who's on it. Anything else, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> no, nope. Your Honor, that, that, that's it. I'm all looking at the zoning and make sure that we're not setting up an RV park there. Hey, Dick? Uh, nothing, Your Honor. I had something going, but it went away. Judy! <laughs> <laughs> I have that promo. <laughs> Follow <laughs> back. I got nothing. <laughs> 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 Anything, Judy? No, I had nothing. And I hey, Jenna Lee. <laughs> well, to add to Dave's thing, um, there, on 3rd Avenue, I've noticed a lot of um, several vehicles that are parked that have flat tires and have had for the yeah. last, I'm not even saying three months, more like a year, yeah. um, that are not being ticketed or addressed. So. She said, the hard to say, if you can't move, yeah, it's got to go. Yeah. I mean, it like this one vehicle is like I swear it's growing into the pavement. So, <laughs> Julie, uh, just answering Dave's question about weeping cedars, I bought a house in 2013. <laughs> it had a weeping cedar, a freshly planted one, and it was the ugliest tree I've ever seen. <laughs> and it had a price tag on it of $225. For so you couldn't. Uh, so I had to chop it down to build a deck on my house anyway. But I tried to give it away. Nobody wanted it. Thank you very much. I'm curious to see what they're going to look like. Bob? Um, I'd like to thank staff for this report uh, in regards to some of the individuals that are eligible uh, for retirement. If you go down that list, it's uh, pretty concerning. Um, and, and understanding what these guys are going to do in the future, you know, uh, there's a lot of experience there, uh, a lot of, I mean, we got people with 29, 30, yeah. And we're not going to replace them the first day. So uh, we, I think we need to really pay attention to this. The unfortunate part is is um, it's going to cost us some money. Uh, compensation is going to be an issue. Uh, I looked around a little bit uh, at some comparisons, and uh, it, some of them are very drastic. So, uh, you know, I, I just think that's something that we got to work on. The other thing is, is I just want to... Um, 
you know, catch a can still has a lot of good things going for it, so stay op optimistic. Uh, you get after, you see people starting to work around their yards, get stuff out of it, get neighbors spring clean up. We got household hazardous waste going, and community starting to wake up from winter, and uh, you go down, and uh, you know, they're pressure washing downtown, getting things going, and so um, I'm looking forward to summer and, and you know, uh, better weather, and just, I think that uh, catch a can is going to do well this summer. So, um, when's our next meeting? Good day. May 4th. Oh, okay. So the first cruise ship, the real cruise ship comes in on the day we have our next meeting. So the season will be begun by the time we get back here. Let's put over birth so we can watch that movie. Yeah, yeah bye. <laughs> That's a good idea. So we do have uh, one more thing, an executive session. Carl says it's going to be quick. Um, it's a um, request for an executive se session, negotiations of the amendment to the Burr 4 lease agreement to undertake facility modifications to accommodate post Panama vessels for the 2019 cruise season. Catch can dock company. Do we have a motion? Your Honor. Yes. I'm with the City Council to declare that consistent with the City Manager report dated April 3rd, 2018, the best interest of City Council to discuss negotiations of the amendment to the lease and other definitive agreements between the City of Catch can uh, dock company. The city of the Ketchikan Dock Company LLC relates to the expansion of Burst 4 to accommodate larger vessels. Uh, executive session in accordance with KMC 2.04.025A1 and 3, uh, which include the need to discuss subject and knowledge of which could have an immediate adverse impact on the finances of the city and to receive legal advice within the attorney client privilege. Second. Moved and second. Call the roll. Yes. Flora? Yes. Flora? Yes. Flora? Yes. Paper? Yes. Paper? Yes. Gage? Okay. Yes. 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 Yes.